Hi, I'm Allison Setti, and I work for the Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind. I also work for the University of Colorado in Boulder. Today, I will be presenting a webinar series about developmental assessment for young children. This webinar has three components. First one being, we'll be discussing Minnesota's child developmental assessment. And the second portion, we'll be talking about MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Assessment, Words and Gestures, and the third portion, we'll be talking about MacArthur Bates Communicative Developmental Assessment, Words and Sentences. Those three portions can be used with children, both hearing and deaf, as well as hard of hearing. And the three assessments can be used to measure a child's current level of functioning and monitoring progress, continued progress. And thirdly, all three assessments can be used to establish early intervention goals. This is part one of a three-part webinar series and it will be about the Minnesota Child Development Inventory. I'm Allison Setti, and if you have any questions about today's presentation, you can feel free to email me at the address shown on the slide below. Today we'll be discussing a description of the Minnesota Child Development Inventory. I'll talk to you about the instructions for administration of this assessment. And I'll also be talking to you about an opportunity for families who have children with hearing loss to participate in a new project entitled NECAP, N-E-C-A-P. Finally, we'll be discussing how to interpret and use the results from the Minnesota. The Minnesota Child Development Inventory is designed to be used with children between 12 months and 6 years of age. It is most sensitive for use with children from 1 to 3, particularly in the language assessment area. This test is a parent report instrument. Parents read short statements about their child and respond with either a yes or a no as to whether their child is able to do a given item or not. So for example, an item might say, has a vocabulary of 20 words or more. And the parent would either circle yes, that their child has that, or no, that they don't. Let me show you a sample page from this assessment. So let's take a look at item 189. Says signs correctly most words he, she uses. That would be an example from the language subscale. Um, that would be a moderately difficult item. And remember that if you're using this particular assessment with children from birth to three, that many of the items are going to be items that are more appropriate for children as they get older. So the items on this particular assessment range all the way from 12 months of age up until six years of age. An example of a more difficult item would be number 187. Puts two sentences together 
with the words and, or, or but. And then if we look down to item 194, understands what off and on mean and follows directions using these words, that would be an item that would be appropriate in the birth to three phase. Parents would go through the entire assessment, answering yes or no to each of the individual items. This particular assessment will look at nine different developmental areas and then also give you a summary score that's entitled General Development. This summary score is a sampling of items from each of the nine areas. The areas that are assessed on this particular instrument are the child's social skills, their self-help skills, gross motor, fine motor, expressive language, language comprehension, beginning letter skills, number skills, and then if you use an adapted version that I'll be telling you a little bit about, you would also be assessing an area which they call situation comprehension, which is from an older version of the Minnesota um, but is one that we like to use with children who are deaf or hard of hearing. And then, as I mentioned, there's also a general development score, which is a composite score of selected items from all of the subtests. The published version of this assessment is available from Pearson Education. And you can also look at the manual online at the following website. At the University of Colorado, we use an adapted version of this assessment for children who are deaf or hard of hearing and who use sign language. They may use sign language in conjunction with spoken language, or they may use sign language only. These adaptations were based on an original adaptation that was done at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. Let's take a look back at that sample page, and I'll give you an idea of what these adaptations look like. Essentially, the adaptations were done for two reasons. One is to make it clear to parents that for the language items, they should circle yes regardless of if their child does a particular language item in sign language or in spoken language. So for example, let's look at item 189. The original test published version says, says correctly most of the words he or she uses. That item has been adapted to be appropriate for children who might use sign language to say says slash signs correctly most words he, she uses. None of the items, there's no additional items on the test and no items have been eliminated. It's just adaptations have been made to individual items so that parents understand that they should give credit for something regardless of if the child is doing it in sign language or spoken language. The test has been further adapted to try to come up with visual counterparts to some of the auditorily based items. So for example, if we look at item 191, the original item says, responds to his or her name, turns, and looks. So we've added an adaptation to that to make it clear to families that it's, they should also respond yes if their child responds to their name if it's signed in their visual field. If you're interested in having a copy of this adapted version, you can feel free to contact me.
Both the, this adapted version is also available in Spanish. However, the published version at this time is not available in Spanish. So just a little review on the adapted version. Clarifications have been made that either sign language or spoken language is acceptable. And for certain grammatical items, there's ASL equivalents. And for certain auditory items, it's been adapted to include a visual counterpart. And again, this adapted version is available in either English or Spanish. The way that this particular instrument is scored is that each of the individual subscales receive an age score, a developmental age score. And then these age scores are plotted on a profile sheet relative to the child's chronological age. Let me show you an example of what the profile sheet would look like. And we're going to take a closer look at a couple of case studies um, and get a closer look at the profile sheet. But essentially, you can see across the page, there's a horizontal line drawn. That horizontal line is at the child's chronological age, their actual age. Then you can see a couple of lines underneath it. The first line underneath indicates a score that would be 20% below a child's chronological age. And then the line underneath that indicates scores that are 30% below a child's chronological age. Based on the information in the test manual, any scores that the child receives that are at least 20% below their age or higher are considered to be within the normal range. Any scores that fall between the 20% below and 30% below lines would be considered a borderline delay, something to keep your eye on. And any scores that fall below the 30% line would be considered to be well below the average range for the child's age. So you can see in this example, we have individual dots. Each one of them is for a different subscale of the Minnesota. And when we look at the case studies, we'll see a closer look at what each of these, um, each subscale that's being referred to. And just on quick glance, we can see this child has a rather uneven performance, where the first four dots are falling within the average range. Then the next two subscales are well below the average range. The next one is in the borderline, the next couple are in the borderline range. And then the very last one along the right line is back into the normal range. So on quick glance, you can see that this child has some areas of development where they're functioning as they should be for their age, and other areas where they're falling below where they should be for their age. Again, we'll take a closer look at that shortly. I want to take a minute to introduce a project that is currently happening through the University of Colorado Boulder. The project is called NECAP, and it stands for the National Early Childhood Assessment Project. This project is assisting interested states in administering two developmental assessments, both of which will be covered in this webinar series. One is the assessment that we're talking about today, the Minnesota Child Development Inventory. And the second will be covered in part two and three of this webinar, and it's the MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventory. This project involves children who are deaf or hard of hearing, and interested states complete the assessments with families in their state, send the assessments to the University of Colorado Boulder, where they're scored and a report is sent back to the child's interventionist and or family about the child's results on the assessment. In addition, an annual accountability report is sent to the participating state or agency so that they are able to track the results of their children as a group over time. For anyone who's interested in getting more information on the NECAP project, or how their state or agency might participate in their project, in the project, you can feel free to contact me at the email below.
Let's talk a bit about the interpretation and use of the results for this particular assessment. One of the things that you can do with the assessment is to identify children who are functioning within versus those functioning below the average range. Because the assessment gives you age scores, this is something that's easily understood by parents and can be looked at relative to the child's actual age. It's easy to monitor progress over time, and by looking at a couple of the subtests, you can get an indication of the child's nonverbal cognitive ability. Those subtests specifically are the self-help and the situation comprehension subtests. Remember, the situation comprehension subtest is not available on the 1992 ver published version of this test, but is available on the adaptation that was done at the University of Colorado Boulder. Another use of this test is to look at the profile sheet to get a visual display of the child's strengths and their limitations. One thing you want to look at is if the scores are consistent across the different developmental domains or if they vary, as the example that we saw previously of a child. Looking at these different developmental areas will help alert the interventionist to possible need for referral to other professionals in other disciplines. So for example, if a speech pathologist is giving this assessment, they're probably well versed in understanding the norms in the speech and language domain. However, they may be less knowledgeable about motor development or self-help development. By giving this assessment, because it's looking across a variety of developmental areas, you'll be able to get an indication of if a referral might be needed for an area outside of your own discipline. So for example, the speech pathologist may see that a referral is warranted either to occupational therapy or to physical therapy. So let's go back and look at a couple of case examples and see what we would make out of them. So this profile sheet is for a child named Jack. He's 31, year, 31 months of age, and this is the results from his Minnesota Child Development Inventory. The way that this is set up is if we look across the top of the page, we can see the labels for the different subscales. So again, going from left to right, we have the social scale, the self-help, the gross motor, the fine motor, expressive language, language comprehension, letters, numbers, and then a general development score. At the far right is the additional subtest that's available on the CU adaptation, which comes from the older version of the Minnesota, and that's the situation comprehension. It's not labeled at the top of the page, because this is the published version's profile sheet and it no longer includes that particular subtest. Down at the bottom of the page, we can see the child's raw scores on each of the subtests along the first line, and then their age score in months along the second line, and then their age score in years and months along the third line. Each of the dots represents the number of items the child got right and what the corresponding age score would be. So remember, the line across the top is indicating the child's chronological age. So if all of the dots fell right along that top line, we would know that the child was scoring exactly where they should be based on their chronological age. If their dots are falling below that line, there means their score to some extent is below what you would expect for their age. Of course, however, there's a normal range of development and not every child, even if they're developing typically, is gonna score exactly where they should be for their chronological age. So if you look between the chronological age line and the 20% below line, the dots falling within that area are all falling within the average range. So for Jack, we can see his social, self-help, gross motor, 
and fine motor skills are all right where they should be for his age. So looking at this particular profile, I don't see any immediate concerns or needs for referrals to other professionals, say for example, occupational therapy or physical therapy. Self-help, as I mentioned, can give you some indication of a child's nonverbal cognitive abilities, and those also seem, in his case, to be right where they should be. So we have four areas that are right within the normal range. Then, as we go down to the fifth area, that's the expressive language subscale, and the one right next to it is the language comprehension subscale. So on the two language subscales, Jack is falling well below the average range. Remember, the 30% line indicates scores that are 30% below a child's chronological age. And scores that fall below this level would be considered to be a significant delay. So based on this assessment, we can see that, that Jack does have intervention needs in the area of language. The next subscale is letters. And what this subscale is looking at are pre-literacy and literacy skills. Remember, Jack is only 31 months of age. So at 31 months, actually not many of the items are expected because most of them are later developing skills. His score, he actually didn't get any of those items right, but that is considered to be typical for his age because we see the dot falls right at the edge of the 20% below, so it's still within the range of chronological age and 20% below chronological age. His number skills, however, um, are falling a bit below what we would hope. So the number skills are right on the 30% below line, and that would be considered significant delay. So that would be another thing that one might want to focus on in working with Jack and his family, is to start to introduce him to number skills um, and also beginning pre-literacy skills because at his age that is something that's going to start being important. The last dot here is the general development score. And remember, that's a composite score where you're taking selected items from the various subscales, averaging them together to get a single age level. So if you have any need for a single age level score that summarizes the child's development, you'd want to look at the general developmental score. And you can even see just visually that it does fall about midway between the different dots for the different subscales, because again, it's really just taking an average of how the child did on the different subscales of the test. Then along the right-hand line, the vertical line, um, we have that final subtest, Situation Comprehension. And you can see at the bottom of the page, that's labeled as SC for Situation Comprehension. These are skills more or less of everyday life. This was a subtest that was on the older version of the Minnesota and is also on our University of Colorado adapted version. And so in Jack's case, we see his Situation Comprehension score is falling well within the average range. Again, that score, in conjunction with the self-help score, can give you some indication of the child's nonverbal cognitive ability. So based on this assessment, I don't have any concerns about Jack's nonverbal cognitive skills. I don't have any concerns about his motor skills. But I do see that his, both his language expression and his language comprehension are falling well below age level and are areas that we would want to be focusing on. Let's take a look at another child who has a somewhat different profile. This is Michael, and Michael is 27 months of age. Take a minute to look at his profile and gather some thoughts about what you think is happening in his particular situation. So we see that Michael has a rather flat profile, unlike Jack, who had a lot of variation between the subscales. 
And in Michael's case, we see that pretty much all of the dots, so all of his age scores, are either falling between 20 and 30 percent below age level, meaning that they're a borderline delay, or they're below the 30 percent line, meaning that they are a significant delay. The two subtests that are, appear to be significantly delayed are the self-help and the situation comprehension. So recall that those are the two subtests that often give you an indication of nonverbal cognitive ability. So from this, administering this assessment and looking at this profile, I'm immediately struck that perhaps Michael is experiencing some cognitive delay. And that would definitely be something that I would want to look into further. Remember that this test, in terms of looking at all the developmental areas, is really just a screening tool. And from looking at these results, I would never definitively want to say that he's experiencing cognitive delays, but I definitely would want to look into it further. If it turns out that that actually is the case, then his profile would be very typical. Because in children who are experiencing cognitive delays, we often see that all areas of development are more or less equally depressed. So, in his case, his motor skills, his language skills, his beginning letter and number skills, his situation comprehension skills, are all more or less at the same level and are all at about 20 to 30 percent below where they should be for his chronological age. So in one sense, from a language standpoint, he actually is developing rather well. Even though his scores are low relative to cognitive age, his chronological age, they seem to be on par with his thinking skills and his overall developmental skills. Let's go back to our presentation. And hop back to our slide looking at the use of results. And let's relate this back to our profiles of Jack and of Michael. So remember, one of the things that you can do with the results from this test is identify children who are functioning within versus those functioning below the average range. So for Jack, what we found is that overall, developmentally, he appears to be functioning within the average range. His motor skills are where they should be, his thinking skills appear to be where they should be, his self-help skills are where they should be. But he has a very specific area of delay, and that's in the area of language. This is often something that we see in the profile of children who are deaf or hard of hearing, who have no additional disabilities where all levels of functioning are where you'd expect. However, sometimes language is somewhat delayed. When we looked at the profile of the second child, Michael, we saw that all areas were somewhat depressed. So that this was a child that was functioning below the average range, really across the board. And that may be indicative of an overall global developmental delay, and something that we would definitely want to explore further. The second point under the use of results is that the age scores are typically easily understood by parents. And remember when we looked at those profile sheets, not only did we have the graphic display, but we also at the bottom of the page had the specific age score in months at each of the individual subtests. That's something that's easy to share with parents and that they can easily understand, whereas sometimes things like percentile ranks or standard scores are less easily understood by a layperson who hasn't had um, tutoring in that particular area. Another thing that these results are good for is to monitor a child's progress over time. So the two profiles we saw were really snapshots of those individual children, how they were doing at a particular age level. But if we administered this test, say, six months from now, we could put the two profiles side by side and see how the child's changed. Are they maintaining where they're at, where, you know, let's say, for example, in the second child, Michael's case, 
Is he still globally depressed, but at about a 20 to 30 percent below chronological age? Or is he becoming more delayed over time? Or is he catching up over time? We could look at the first child's profile, Jack, and see, okay, we had concerns initially about the language areas, language expression, language comprehension. Is that something that's improved over time? Are those dots moving into either the borderline delay category or, hopefully, into the category that would show that he's within the average range? So it's very easy to put the profile sheets one next to another and see how the profile is either maintaining itself or changing as the child gets older. The last point on this slide is that the situation and self-help subscales can be used to estimate nonverbal cognition. We found that in the first child's case, it looked like nonverbal cognition was right where it should be. However, in the second child's case, we had concerns. So the profile sheet is going to give you a visual display of areas of strengths and areas of limitation. So one question you always want to ask yourself when looking at the profile is, are the scores across the different developmental domains consistent with each other, or do they vary? And we saw two very different examples of that. In the first child, Jack, the scores really varied across developmental domains where he seemed to have a very specific deficit in the area of language with all other developmental areas where they should be. On the other hand, the second child, Michael, showed a very consistent pattern with all developmental domains being slightly depressed relative to chronological age. So, as we said, this profile can alert the interventionist to possible referrals to other disciplines. In the first child, Jack, if the person administering the assessment was not a speech-language pathologist, then clearly a referral to that discipline would be warranted based on his results. On the other hand, there didn't seem to be at this time any need to refer to OT or for PT services. The second child, Michael, his profile would alert us to look more deeply at his cognitive functioning, bring in a developmental specialist, possibly a psychologist, look at the etiology that brought him to early intervention to try to determine if he does have global developmental delays um, or if there might be some other reason that would explain his depressed scores. Another way that you can use the results from this assessment is to look at the responses that the parent made on the form and compare it to the developmental order of the items which are presented in the test manual. Again, this manual is available online at the website that I indicated earlier. And let me show you what that looks like. So on the actual form that the family completes, the items are arranged by developmental category. So in other words, all the social items are together, all the motor items are together, and all the language items are together. However, the items are scrambled within the category so that they are not listed in a developmental sequence. This is a more valid measurement because parents aren't led to feel that their child should be doing earlier items, even if perhaps they aren't. And they don't stop at a particular point feeling like, well, everything's now getting harder and my child can't do anything after that. Not every child is going to develop skills in a perfectly linear order. And so we want families to really consider each item individually without thinking about whether the item might really be too easy or too hard for their child. But when it comes to planning your goals for therapy, you're going to want to know the developmental sequence of the items. And that's where these pages of the manual will come in handy for you. So we can see, for example, this particular page is from the expressive language scale. It tells us that that scale has 50 items to it, and it's chunked the items based on the age level at which most children would obtain that item. 
So we see in the very beginning, there's a couple of items at the 6 to 12 month level. But really, this assessment is designed for children at one year and above. So the bulk of the items are going to be from 1 to 2, one to two years old, 2 to 3 years old, 3 to 4 years old. I'm sorry, this is for children from one year of age up to six years of age. So if we look at the next category, the ages one to two, we can see what items fall in that age range and what's appropriate for a child who's between one and two years of age. And then next to each of the items, it will tell you even more specifically at what age level would most children be able to do that given item. And it presents that information for the earlier ages and months and then if you look, say, at the two to three age category, it switches over to presenting them in years hyphen months. So let's take a look at the third item under the age one to two category. So it says, points to things. Then if we follow it across, we can see that that item is mastered by most children when they hit 12 months of age. Looking over to the second column of items, we see many items in the age 3 to 4 category. So items that are appropriate for children between 3 and 4 years of age. The first item in that category says, talks in the past tense correctly. For example, says, I played with Billy. I did. We went. Now know that in the CU adapted version of this test, that item has an ASL equivalent to it. And we would expect the children would be using the past tense at right about three years and zero months of age. We know that by looking just to the right of the item where we see it says three dash zero. So what one can do is after a family completes the form, you can look through it and see, you can even copy this particular page and mark off all the items that the child, that the parent indicated the child was able to do. Then you can get a really clear picture of developmentally where the child is at and what the next steps are. So, for example, if you look at a form a given family fills out and you see, oh, okay, they answered that the child was able to do the first two items. They jabber, they call the parent mama or dada or something similar. Um, so they're doing the items in the six to 12 month age category. You may find they're doing all the items at the one to two year age level as well. But then when you get to the two to three year age level, you may see a more sporadic pattern where they're able to do some of the items, but not all of them. So your next step then would be look at the child's chronological age and compare it to what items they cannot do yet. If the items they can't do really are above their actual chronological age, then there's really no need to develop goals above and beyond just alerting to parents what might be coming up next and what they might want to be encouraging in their child. However, if you find, hmm, there's a number of items that are actually mastered by most children when they're younger than the child that I'm working with, then those would immediately become the items that you would be considering for goals of intervention and things that the fa you would want the family to be working on or introducing the child to. Let's take a quick look at another subscale. And let's look at the gross motor. This can be very handy, especially if you're a professional who's say, working primarily with the child on speech and language, um, but you're curious if the child has gross motor delays and what might you be telling the family to do while waiting for a referral to a physical therapist. 
So you can look through the items, see the developmental order, pinpoint where the child is at at the current time, and look at what the next steps would be. So just going back to our PowerPoint, in terms of looking at the manual and the developmental sequence of the different items, a couple of things that one might want to do. First is identify where are the specific items where the child is showing delay. What items on that list is the child not doing that they should be doing for their chronological age? One of the questions you'll want to ask yourself is do you feel like the child is actually truly delayed and unable to do a particular skill? Or perhaps do they just lack the opportunity? So for example, with the motor items, if you know that this is a child who's frequently carried about and whose family maybe is reluctant to, for them to take physical risks, you might feel that some of these items could be mastered if the child is just given more opportunity to do that. And that's something that you'll know by combining the results you get from this assessment with what you know about the family. Another thing you can look at is if there's any single skill that seems to be really dramatically impacting the child's final age score. One example of this is in the area of feeding. If you're working with a child who uses a feeding tube, they're going to lose points on many items in the self-help area because many of those beginning items have to do with eating by mouth. So if you see, ah, oh, in self-help, the child scored very low. However, the items that they're actually missing that are technically appropriate for their age are all items that involve food and eating by mouth, then that allows you to the, interpret the score in that light that perhaps they really don't have a delay in the area of self-help, but at the current time for physical reasons, they're not able to have the opportunity to get points for those items. Another thing you're going to do with the manual that lists the items in developmental order is identify what the next steps are for the child in whatever skill areas that you're working on. Well, this concludes today's presentation of the Minnesota Child Development Inventory. I hope you'll join us in our next presentation, which will be about the MacArthur Bates Communicative Developmental Inventory, Words and Gestures.